The 1st of August, 1936, Berlin, Germany. After musical fanfares directed by the famous composer Richard Strauss announce Adolf Hitler's arrival to the largely German crowd, the Nazi dictator opens the 11th Summer Olympic Games. By sending their teams to the Games, the 49 nations have legitimized the Nazi regime both in the eyes of the world and of German domestic audiences. The Third Reich intends to use the event for propaganda purposes and promotes an image of a new, strong, and united Germany while masking the regime's targeting of Jews and Roma, as well as its growing militarism. The games present foreign spectators with the image of a peaceful and tolerant Germany and are a resounding propaganda success for the Nazis. Among 100,000 spectators during the opening ceremony is a French female athlete who is the Führer's honored guest. During World War II, this daughter of a French aristocrat will collaborate with Nazis and the Vichy France regime, and for her involvement in torture and enjoying it, will become known as the Hyena of Gestapo. Her name is Violette Morris. Violette Morris, the youngest of six sisters, was born on the 18th of April, 1893 in Paris, France. Her parents were Elisabeth Sacchini, who came from an upper-class Arab family in Jerusalem, and Baron Pierre-Jacques Maurice, a retired cavalry officer. Young Violette attended a monastery school in Huy, Belgium, where the physical education classes were taught by British nuns, who were active amateur athletes. They noticed Violette's sporting talent, and from the age of 15, Maurice trained at a boxing club. The First World War began on the 28th of July, 1914, and the boxing club where Violette trained was closed and converted into a Red Cross center. In August 1914, she married Cyprian Edouard Joseph Garot. Violette then volunteered for the front, worked as an ambulance driver and courier, and was known for her courage. However, in the summer of 1916, she fell ill with pleurisy and spent several months in a military hospital and did not return to the front. The Great War ended on the 11th of November, 1918, and the same year her parents died, leaving her considerable inheritance. Her marriage, which had presumably been arranged, ended in divorce in 1923. Violette Morris was very strong and masculine in appearance, weighing 68 kilograms at 1.66 meters tall. Although her rather chubby figure did not suggest it, she had incredible speed. She practiced numerous sports including discus, shot put, and water polo in the national team when there was no women's team. Moreover, she also competed in boxing, often against men, against whom she sometimes also won. She played in two Parisian soccer teams for Femina Sport Paris from 1917 to 1919, for Olympique Paris from 1920 to 1926, and for the French national team. She competed in road and track cycling as well as car racing, horse riding, tennis and swimming. She was ambitious and successful in all sports, and her motto was, What a man can do, Violette can do. In total, she won 20 national titles, around 10 medals in national and international competitions, took part in more than 150 athletics competitions, and competed in more than 200 soccer matches. During one of the matches, she punched a soccer referee and had also been accused of giving amphetamines to other players. Violette Morris was a well-known personality in the Parisian artistic and bohemian scene and had long-standing friendships with American-born entertainer Josephine Baker, actor Jean Marais, and poet, author, and filmmaker Jean Cocteau. In 1928, the French Women's Sports Federation refused to renew Morris's sport license because of her lifestyle which is why she was unable to compete at the 1928 Olympics in Amsterdam. She ignored the role regulations and wore pants, which at the time was forbidden for women. She rode a motorcycle, was a chain smoker, lived an openly lesbian lifestyle, and swore often. Morris had both her breasts removed by a mastectomy, according to her own statement, to fit more easily behind the wheel of her racing car. After 1928, her auto racing license was revoked on similar moral grounds, and Morris started a car parts store in Paris. Along with her employees, she built racing cars, but the business went bankrupt. In 1930, Morris unsuccessfully sued the French Women's Sports Federation, claiming damages as she could no longer earn wages competing as an athlete. 
During the trial, an obscure ordinance from 1800 forbidding women to wear trousers was used against her. After the trial, Morris said, We live in a country made rotten by money and scandals, ruled by speechifiers, schemers, and cowards. This country of little people is not worthy of its elders, not worthy of survival. Someday, its decay will bring it to the level of a slave. But if I'm still here, I won't be one of the slaves. Believe me, it's not in my temperament. In 1935, a German journalist, Gertrude Hanecker, a former rival in car racing, is said to have contacted Morris to recruit her as a spy for the SD, the Nazi German security service. Morris knew people all over France and had gained experience in the First World War, which made her interesting for the SD. Morris is said to have subsequently traveled through France and gathered information about the locations of the French army, especially about the Maginot Line, the defense system along the French-German border, and France's most modern tank, the Sommer S-35 main battle tank. In the meantime, she lived on her houseboat on the Seine and made a living by giving tennis and driving lessons and black market trading. When on the 1st of August 1936, Adolf Hitler opened the 11th Olympic Games, Violet Morris was invited to attend the event by Adolf Hitler himself, becoming his guest of honor. In 1931, the International Olympic Committee had awarded the 1936 Summer Olympics to Berlin. The choice signaled Germany's return to the world community after its isolation in the aftermath of defeat in the First World War. Two years later, Nazi Party leader Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany and quickly turned the nation's fragile democracy into a one-party dictatorship that persecuted Jews, Roma, all political opponents and others. The Nazi claim to control all aspects of German life also extended to sports. German sports imagery of the 1930s served to promote the myth of Aryan racial superiority and physical prowess. In sculpture and in other forms, German artists idealized athletes' well-developed muscle tone and heroic strength and accentuated ostensibly Aryan facial features. Such imagery also reflected the importance the Nazi regime placed on physical fitness, a prerequisite for military service. In April 1933, an Aryans-only policy was instituted in all German athletic organizations. Non-Aryans, Jews or individuals with Jewish parents, and Roma were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. The German Boxing Association expelled professional lightweight heavyweight champion Erich Zelich in April 1933 because he was Jewish. Another Jewish athlete, Daniel Prenn, Germany's top-ranked tennis player was removed from Germany's Davis Cup team. Gretel Bergmann, a world-class high jumper, was expelled from her German club in 1933 and excluded from the German Olympic team in 1936. Jewish athletes barred from German sports clubs flocked to separate Jewish associations, including the Maccabee and Shield groups, and to improvised segregated facilities. But these Jewish sports facilities were not comparable to well-funded German groups. Roma, including the Sinti boxer Johann Röckeli Trollmann, were also excluded from German sports. As a token gesture to placate international opinion, German authorities allowed the star fencer Helena Meyer to represent Germany at the Olympic Games in Berlin. Meyer was viewed as a non-Aryan because her father was Jewish. She won a silver medal in the women's individual fencing and, like all other medalists for Germany, gave the Nazi salute on the podium. No other Jewish athlete competed for Germany in the Summer Games. Still, nine athletes who were Jewish or of Jewish parentage won medals in the Nazi Olympics, including Meyer and five Hungarians. Seven Jewish male athletes from the United States went to Berlin. Like some of the European Jewish competitors at the Olympics, many of these young men were pressured by Jewish organizations to boycott the Games. These athletes chose to compete for a variety of reasons. Most did not fully grasp at the time the extent and purpose of Nazi persecution of Jews and other groups. In August 1936, the Nazi regime tried to camouflage its violent racist policies while it hosted the Summer Olympics. Most anti-Jewish signs were temporarily removed, and newspapers toned down their harsh rhetoric in line with the directives from the propaganda ministry headed by Josef Goebbels. Thus, the regime exploited the Olympic Games to present foreign spectators and journalists with a false image of a peaceful, tolerant Germany. 
the Nazis, made elaborate preparations for the Summer Games, and a huge sports complex was constructed, including a new stadium and state-of-the-art Olympic village for housing the athletes. Olympic flags and swastikas bedecked the monuments and houses of a festive, crowded Berlin. Most tourists were unaware that the Nazi regime had temporarily removed anti-Jewish signs, nor did they know of a police roundup of Roma in Berlin, ordered by the German Ministry of the Interior. On the 16th of July 1936, some 800 Roma residing in Berlin and its environs were arrested and interned under police guard in a special camp in the Berlin suburb of Marzahn. Germany emerged victorious from the 11th Olympic Games. German athletes captured the most medals, and German hospitality and organization won the praise of visitors. Most newspaper accounts echo the New York Times report that the Games put Germany back in the fold of nations and even made the Germans more human again. However, reality was very different. Two days after the Olympics, Captain Wolfgang Fürstner, head of the Olympic village, killed himself when he was dismissed from military service because of his Jewish ancestry. With the conclusion of the Games, Germany's expansionist policies and the persecution of Jews and others deemed as enemies of the state accelerated, culminating in World War II and the Holocaust. On Christmas Eve 1937, Violette Morris was arrested for killing a former legionnaire on board her houseboat. Morris was tried in March 1938 but was acquitted when the court accepted her plea of self-defense. The Second World War started on the 1st of September 1939 when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. The campaign in Poland ended on the 6th of October the same year, with Germany and the Soviet Union dividing and annexing the whole of the country. The German invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands started on the 10th of May 1940 and became known as the Battle of France. These countries, along with France, were conquered within six weeks. During the German occupation of France, Manus is believed to have continued to work for the Germans, especially for the commander of the security police in Paris, Helmut Knochen. Her main responsibilities during the war were to disrupt the operation of the Special Operations Executive, a British-run organization that helped the resistance. In addition to being a spy for the Nazis, she was also involved in the torture of suspects during interrogation. Her reputation for involvement in torture and enjoying it resulted in her becoming known as the Hyena of the Gestapo. On the 26th of April, 1944, while driving in her car on a country road in Normandy with the Bayel family, who were favorably positioned with the Nazi regime in France, Morris's car sputtered and came to a halt. Earlier in the day, the engine had been tampered with by members of the French resistance. When the car stopped, resistance members emerged from a hiding spot and opened fire on the car. Those sitting within the vehicle, the three adults, including the then 51-year-old Violette Morris and two children, were killed. Morris's body, riddled with bullets, was taken to a morgue, where it remained unclaimed for months, before being buried in an unmarked communal grave. There were no tears shed for Violet Morris. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you. And we'll see you next time on the channel.